Hello and welcome back. Unit 4, Lecture 5, Dada and Surrealism. So the main art to look out for in the section on the Dada movement truly is Duchamp. We've already talked a little bit about his nude descending staircase, but we're going to look at other examples of that as well. We talked about nude descending staircase fitting a little better into the futurist style, but we're going to look at the full-on Dada style of Duchamp we'll move and pay attention to the Surrealists, and the Surrealist style includes, of course, your friend Salvador Dali, but I want you also to know work by de Quirico, Magritte, and Chagall. Now, the term Dada is one you may not be familiar with. Dada is a really nonsense term that was chosen at random, and there's different uh, legends about how the name for the style was chosen. Uh, there is a French term for hobby horse, chair or horse that uh, kids play on uh, that in French could be called the da. Uh, it is also believed that it was just the word yes repeated da da or that it was purely a completely nonsensical sound. Another legend says that the word was chosen just by kind of sticking a pen knife, a thin like exacto blade into a dictionary, opening the dictionary at that point and picking the first word. Uh, so a lot of references there are to this idea of spontaneity and of nonsense. And Dada, you could think of as truly um, an art of anarchy, an art that breaks more than anything we've seen before. We definitely want to take a quick look at the Armory show. This slide shows you only artwork was included in that exhibition. These are the actual pieces that were shown among many, many others. The exhibition is 1,300 artworks, 300 artists were represented, 100 were relatively well-known European names. Um, even if people didn't like them, they came to see them because they'd heard of people like Matisse, Cezanne, Van Gogh, Georges Brock. But there were actually more American artists in the show than European. There were 100 Europeans, 200 Americans. The show attracted a thousand visitors, which is pretty remarkable for the year 1913. The show actually went on tour and went to the city of Chicago. Now in Chicago, the students of the Art Institute objected to the artwork of particularly Matisse. They made copies of them in front of their school. So that's kind of interesting to think about how people reacted to this shocking new art. So the every show featured pretty important works by major Europeans and up-and-coming Americans, and of course included this piece. This is a piece, of course, by Duchamp. It is Nude Descending a Staircase. We talked about how the figure can be broken down. If you look closely, this seems to be an eyebrow ridge, nose to mouth. There's the head, chest, torso to waist, arm to bow to the wrist, hips, thigh to knee, knee to foot. There's your calf muscle on the back, shin on the front, and a that comes forward. So clearly this piece is very, very abstract and creates the illusion of a figure repeating itself on top of itself as it comes down the staircase. You can even pretty clearly see a suggestion of the stairs themselves here and here. So this piece was definitely a little bit closer futurist style than the Dada style, but Duchamp becomes the de facto leader of this new movement. The Dada artists were an art of anarchy, and they did in fact have a manifesto, a set of rules about how their work would be made, and rule number one is that there shouldn't be any manifestos. So their manifesto, it's awesome, right? These are artists who are very, very influential in the 20 teens and 2020s who are intentionally trying to make art in new and different ways and to break rules about what art should be and ha always has been. Artists who do kind of rebellious things like the spray paint graffiti movement artists like Banksy in particular do kind of draw their inspiration the Dada artists were doing. So these are some famous Dada pieces by Duchamp and they're baffling. They don't look like they 
have much in common. The piece on the far right is what we would call a ready-made sculpture. And that was the term that they used for what we could call that's a pretty hard art history term. A found object is an object you done, went out, and found. That's all it is. It could be anything, a object, a man-made thing, something you found in the real world, appropriated, took, and then rearranged in some way. So in this case, you have a bicycle that now is useless as a mode of transportation attached to a stool that's useless for sitting or standing on. These two things now no longer function joined together. The piece on the left, at first glance, looks like the Mona Lisa. It's kind of a cheap uh, postcard reproduction of her that has graffiti-style mustache, kind of curly Salvador Dali mustache, a little goatee drawn on it. I've done that with all and talking on the phone, doodling on the back of a phone book or a magazine, for instance. But to deface the most important point in the history of Western art is a shocking thing. The initials written here at the bottom, these letters, L-H-O-O-Q, if you pronounce them in which I'm terrible at, but we do know that the word E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, pronounced L, is the French for she. L-H-O-O-Q is a very, if you say it in the right way, if you say it fast enough, almost sounds like you're saying she's got a hot, won't fill in the beep there, but you kind of get an idea of what we might be aiming for. So he's mocking this super famous thing. He's mocking uh, gender issues. He's mocking um, issues of her being a sexual object, and he's defacing a famous thing. So the of course is not done to the real Mona Lisa. It was done on a reproduction, but it's very much in the Dada spirit about getting rid of the art of the past that made him the most notorious that was this one. The piece in the middle is called a fountain. And believe me, that is not what you want a fountain to look like. That's actually a urinal uh, turned on its side, so the holes would be allowing waste to drain away to be too graphic, but you see that he signed it and dated it as if it's something he's made. He signed it with a fake name, right? Like an assumed um, and this piece was submitted for an exhibition of sculpture in which pretty much anyone who sent in a submission was guaranteed. Now, can you imagine what people who had spent their lifetimes learning how to carve realistic images in stone thought of this on a pedestal as a piece of sculpture? They were hugely offended. It took no skill to do this, and that, you know, people were enraged. But think culture today depends on taking and repurposing something that already exists. In the music industry in particular, many songs, even in 2020, all you have to do is turn on the radio and you hear songs that are contemporary, that have bass lines, even lyrics as far back as the 70s. So we recycle, reuse, and change things on the daily. We're doing this constantly. You're in the 2020s. If we ever go back to campus and see each other again, you'll see kids on campus dressed in flannel that came from the 90s, with super tight jeans that look like they came from the 2010s, with haircuts and shoes that look like they came from the they all go together, and yet they're awesome when they're put together. That's the Dada spirit, is making something out of something that something that pokes fun at people who've got the power and are telling you how things have to be. It is really the art of the Dada artists invented and the surrealist artists played this game, which I thought you guys might like. It's kind of fun. Good thing to do in quarantine if you're quarantined. People, the surrealist drawing game here known as the exquisite corpse. It is a process in which you can kind of see right here the piece was folded and a line here where the piece was folded. Usually the way these are done is the first person creates the head, you could draw it, you fold the piece over but leave a little bit showing. 
The next person then adds in the torso. So this kind of suggests harm. Torso to the waist. You fold yours over so the next person can only see a tiny bit. They add the legs, right? So you end up creating something that looks completely ridiculous but is somehow connected. The game actually started as a verbal game, and you guys may know the game Mad Libs, right? Where you get a pre printed sheet with words missing and they tell you to fill it in with a different type of speech, like noun, person's name, adjective, number, right? The Dada Surreal Exquisite Corpse game started this way. The first person wrote down an article. So an article is a, an, or the, and an adjective is a word that describes a noun, a description word. The sec second and a verb. A noun is a person, place, or thing. A verb is an action. And the last person writes down an article at a, an, or the, a description, and a person, place, or thing. So the first time they play the game, three people writing at the same time, they can't see. The first person wrote the exquisite article adjective. The next person, noun, verb, wrote corpse drinks. The last person wrote article adjective noun, the new wine. So the whole sentence read the exquisite corpse drinks the new wine. Now, could the people playing without seeing each other's words know that the verb drink would get picked up by the noun wine in the Dada works is spontaneous creation of things that sometimes almost make sense. So the exquisite corpse was a horrible connection of a terrible adjective, right, or a beautiful adjective and a terrible thing, the idea of a dead body. So that juxtaposition what the Dada movement is about. So Exquisite Corpse stuck as the name for the whole game, whether it was visual or not. This is another Dada idea, a collage through random objects. Kurt Schwitters would sometimes make what, make what he called Murs pictures. That was his word for it, made up word. Things up in the air and gluing them down in whatever order they fell, whatever location they fell. There's a Murs one. The Dada style was definitely the old in favor of the new, it kind of dies out by the 20s and gets taken over by the surrealist movement. Now, the first time that it gets used is by the poet and author Apollinaire in 1917. The official manifesto of surrealism is written in 1904, and the idea is to use psychic, meaning your imagination, your dream world, automatism, things being done in its pure state, verbally by means of the written word or in another manner, meaning depictions in paint. So the that is dictated by thought in the absence of control exercised by reason or by aesthetic rules or morals. Image is as if an opium image, right? Something that comes to you in a hallucinogenic effect. You can't you're powerless now. Those are all words that come to us from the Surrealist Manifesto. And the idea is that ultimately what you're seeing is reality, but beneath reality, an interior reality, the world of dreams, the world of nightmares, the world perhaps of hallucinations, a sense where you're under the influence of um, a drug or, or even alcohol. Now, not all of the artists were drug addicts by any stretch of the imagination. Them were very straight edge and did not want to participate in using any type of drugs because they believed their dreams were terrifying enough. Up here, Max Ernst is one of the leaders of the Surrealist movement, and at first these look like believable landscapes until you learn how he did them. They're done even as frottage, they're rubbings. You might have done this as a kid. You might have used a crayon to um, rub on a piece of paper on top of some the texture to create an impression. That's how these were made and then cut and pasted together to make these impossible landscapes. This is the work of Dorothy. Dorothy Tanning is uh, at one time married to Max Ernst. She's an American female surrealist. Most people know Salvador Dali's box, right? 
as that's the real or the surrealist image that most people know. I actually much prefer her paintings to his. They're more. We think often of the sunflower as a happy image. Think Van Gogh sunflowers. Here, it's a sunflower that's crawling around in a hallway waiting to kill. How about those late 90s, early 2000s American versions of Japanese horror movies with the girls with wet hair appearing? She's got that on lock, I think. Dorothea Tanning. Giorgio Di Chirico is an Italian surrealist and a piece his uh, painting at the top left there, which is known as the mystery and melancholy of the street. And at first glance, it looks like just abstracted um, image of a believable um, cityscape until you really look at the perspective, which is impossible. If we orthogonal leading line on the perspective of this building, our vanishing point should be somewhere up here, but that doesn't jive with these weird angles coming hill to a perspective vanishing point below, that's impossible. We also see that the main figure seems here in kind of shaded silhouette, a kind of a kid's game, but then there's this eerie shadow falling on the ground over here. I get the distinct feeling that we're in an alley, that there's no from this space. She's headed toward this object that looks like a cart with a door open on the back as if it's going to Cargo and be moved. That figure feels kind of threatening now, doesn't it? Like he's going to get her and force her into this space and abscond with her quality to what De Chirico is doing. And that is very much part of the surrealist movement. Here's the one you already knew, right? Persistence of memory. Salvador Dali specifically called his method the paranoic critical method. And he did very strange things to induce the state of mind to come up with these images. They were self-induced hallucinogenic experiences. Now that sounds like, oh, he was just all the time. He would do any number of things, including simple things like stand on his head, leaning against a wall, until all the blood rushed to his, head, to his feet. And that sense of disorientation, images would come to him kind of spontaneously and they would go into the paintings. So quite frankly, just about this sense of being trippy or weird that students often will refer to these paintings as. They're really trying hard images that evoke some kind of deep emotional state. So think about the last time you had a nightmare about something. Very often in dreams, we experience things that we have suppressed in our normal day-to-day -day lives, things that you think you've dealt with, but that you haven't pop up and scare you in a nightmare. So much of Dali's work is about a dream state. His later work at the end of his life is very quote unquote realistic. The proportions are right and very accurate. You see the style and quality of what he's doing, but he's presenting you multiple points story at the same time in an impossible way. We're inside and outside at a landscape. We're seeing the crucified crowd Christ at the Last Supper, but all of that happening as if it's simultaneous, and the shape of what seems to be the architecture of the room there evokes the shape of a coffin as well. It's kind of a remarkable painting. His more quote-unquote realistic images are the ones that he does toward the end. But Dali is also really adept at uh, creating designs for films. So the image at the top left is quite a disturbing one. It made with a Spanish director. Um, the film was made with a Spanish director, Louis Buñuel, and the film is called Un Find it on YouTube. It is not for everybody's taste, but it is out there. Uh, there are some very shocking scenes in it in which there are some kind of similarities between things that people see and then actions that they take. There's a scene where a boyfriend-girlfriend couple, he steps looks out at the sky, sees a thin cloud going across uh, the moon, and then it cuts to the shot that you see there where he pulls her eyelid open and draws a razor blade across it. The effect is a special effect. It's not real, but it's very shocking. It's really shocking. A 
made. The images at the bottom are from a film that he collaborated on in the 1940s with Alfred Hitchcock, the director of Sun. And in this storyline, the main character is having amnesia and repressed memory. He's been through a trauma and he can't sort through the images so his psychiatrist puts him under hypnosis, and we see some of the same references to that eye, and very often those eyes then are cut apart by scissors. In this sequence here, the eyes are on curtains, and then a man goes around with scissors and cuts the curtains open. So there's um, definitely, I think, some that is compelling to Dali. It doesn't take much to think that hurting your eye, pain in your eye, would be something that would people's anxieties. So of course it's a perfect surrealist image. Kind of interesting case. Rene Magritte is a painter who is not um, in taking any stimulant to create hallucinations. He believed that his interior life was dark enough as it was. One of his most famous pieces here, Treachery of Images, it says in French, translated to English, this is not a pipe. And yet the painting is super Realistically believable, highlight, shadow, reflection. So he again is kind of reminding us that art is a lie, but it's that lie that Picasso that reveals the truth. These are other Magritte paintings. I just thought you would enjoy them because they are images of paintings that seem to bleed off the canvas into the real world or that seem to just be openings into the real world. Kind of remarkable work. There are plenty of other surreal who was married to the American female painter Kay Sage, who did the piece on the right that feels like a person wrapped in cloth but with an impossible void where the heart should be. Pretty incredibly intense. And then Merritt Oppenheim. Merritt Oppenheim was the subject of many uh, uh, by the um, American photographer uh, of the Dada movement, Man Ray. These are her sculptures. Uh, my favorite one is teacup covered in fur, which is just such a perfectly surrealistic thing. It looks like what it is meant to be, a cup and saucer and spoon, but I never want to use that. The image at the bottom is pretty awesome as well. It sort of references trussing uh, a bird and dressing the bone, the thigh where that's been removed with those little twirly, lacy white objects as if you're going to roast an animal, um, and instead they're women's shoes. There's clearly a kind of psychosexual message behind this piece. Paul Delvaux in kind of brings forth some images that feel like they mythology into this new modern style of the 30s. And then of course a really well-known um, painter Frida Kahlo. Frida is one of the best of the artists of the um, surrealist movement, although she objected to that title. She said, I did not paint my dreams, I painted my reality. And there's one of her realities right there. That image on the left is called the broken column. She suffered uh, greatly from an accident. She was involved, collided with a truck. The handrail that passengers hold on to actually broke off and pierced through her body, womb and the spine. Uh, she had multiple surgeries over the rest of the course of her life, um, 30 in total, and she suffered as well as sometimes inability to move without extreme pain. So you see needles or nails all through the body and the body exposed, the spine is a column that's been broken and reassembled. On the top right, you have the two Fridas, her as a proper uh, woman of high uh, income and on the right as the more humble version of herself, the two different sides of her story coming together. And I wanted you to see this, the way she was treated in the and is nowadays far less well known than she is. Her husband was Diego Rivera, who was a super famous muralist painter. He did large scale murals. In fact, he was commissioned to do a piece in America at the Rockefeller Center, which he included um, images of socialists. There were images of uh, socialist leaders. Lenin was in it, and people really objected to it, and they asked him to change it the commission, sent him back to Mexico. They took a jackhammer and took the painting down. I mean, he was a notorious and a big name. Y'all have never heard of him. 
right? But you've heard of Frida. It's kind of interesting how those things change over time. She's now much more well-known than he is, but I wanted you to see how she was treated in the in America. While her husband's making this big painting, that's a news story that was run. The headline, I don't know if you can read it on the screen, it says, wife of the master gleefully dabbles in works of art. How insulting is that? Marc Chagall is another one of the famous members of the socialist movement. His work is a little less believable in its depictions of reality, but he combines things, makes things transparent. I particularly two figures that are perhaps walking on opposite sides of the street. The houses that are associated with her are upside down to the ones associated with him as if both sides of the street are folded together to create this image. Chagall's paintings most of the time reference his life. Um, originally uh, was from a small town um, and was removed from Russia during the uh, Second World War. And so his images often refer to his village life. Um, you see things like the image of the cows, horses, those types of things come up quite a lot in his work, I and the village. I also wanted you though to seek work from near the end of his career when he was commissioned to do large scale work. And so the designs that you see there, there's 12 of them. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the actual um, image itself for the tribe of Daniel. And at the very bottom, you see three of the windows. That's a relatively square shaped architecture of the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, teaching hospital. So each one of those uh, rounded window forms has stained glass inside it. Here's what they look like from the inside. They're just absolutely gorgeous. Other famous surrealists include the Spanish painter Juan and Miro's paintings look almost like kind of abstract cartoons. Paul Clay, who was known for intentionally painting like a child on the left, called Twittering Machine, birds on a little crank. And Alberto Giacometti, another artist who did surrealistic forms in sculpture, most of his images are extraordinarily thin and they kind of spread out slightly at hips and shoulders.